see on the screen behind me, um, we're going to be looking at the encounter that Paul had on Mars Hill with the Greeks. But just to um, give us a little bit of background, the Apostle Paul left Philippi on good terms with the brethren and unlike the authorities, the brethren were sad to see them go. And they travelled first through Amphipolis, then Apollonia, and then on to Thessalonica. And having found opposition from the Jews that we read of there in verse 4 through 9, the brethren sent Paul to Berea. And we read that the Jews of Thessalonica followed them and caused such problems there also that the brethren hurriedly moved Paul on again. And the way the words of verse 14 read, to go as it were to the sea, suggests some ambiguity in travel plans, such as might be expected with last minute arrangements. In the absence of telephones and websites, one simply turned up at the docks and made personal inquiries. Incidentally, for those who are interested, this was the method employed by Jonah in Jonah 1 verse 3, and by the centurion who later took the Apostle Paul to Rome in Acts 27 verse 6. And so they turned up at the docks and they boarded a ship that took them to Athens. Whoops, one too many stops. So we can see there, they've come from Philippi through Amphipolis, Thessalonica, Berea, and then by sea down to Athens. When they reached Athens, Luke records that when Paul saw the extent of their idolatry and that's um, what's left of uh, a circle of altars to various deities, when Paul saw stuff like that in Athens, Luke records his spirit was stirred within him. And it was this, perhaps, more than anything else that prompted the preaching of the Apostle Paul there in Athens, as the word therefore in verse 17 suggests. What about us, brothers and sisters? We live in a very cosmopolitan city that's wholly given to idolatry. Does this stir us? We need perhaps to just take an excursion in thought back to the life of our Lord and consider how ignorance and lack of guidance among the people affected him. Matthew 9 verse 35 through 38 is a reference that you can look up in, in your own time. But Jesus said, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send labourers into the harvest. And when Jesus made that prayer, who do you suppose he wanted to send? Well, it's us, isn't it? We're the labourers that Christ and the apostles would have go to preach the gospel to those in ignorance and superstition. In the Beatitudes, there are blessings prescribed for those who mourn, for those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, and it occurs to me that the stirrings that we read of here in Acts 17 within Paul were a mixture of anger, of sadness, of a desire to see God's righteousness prevail. And so it was always likely that the efforts of Paul were going to be blessed. Paul preached to three groups of people in Athens the Jews in their synagogue, the devout people and the ordinary Greeks in the marketplace. And you can't imagine that his reasoning, as the word disputed in verse 17 might be better translated, you can't imagine that the reasoning of Paul was the same to each group. When encountering the Jews, one might have expected his approach to be similar to that which he took in Acts 13, where he rehearsed the Jewish history for them and demonstrated that Messiah, Jesus, was both the promised seed and heir to David's throne. The devout Greeks were perhaps somewhat 
acquainted with the God of Israel. They would have had some association with the Jews and some of them may have been what is termed proselytes of the gate. That is, they had not converted to Judaism but had sympathies with them and with their God. And we're not told how Paul directed his preaching towards those and we're left to wonder how he might have done it. The record does tell us quite a bit about the Greeks in the marketplace. And we don't need to confuse the marketplace here in Athens with the fruit and vegetable merchants down the road at the central market. The agoras of ancient Athens were quite different. True, there may have been merchants in the marketplace, but the marketplace in ancient Athens was considered to be a forum for discussion. It was a place where the men gathered to discuss prevailing opinions and philosophies. These weren't the upper crust philosophers necessarily, but more of the ordinary sort. It's difficult to imagine that Paul didn't tailor his message to suit the audience. We know, for example, this was his approach in Corinth, and there's no reason to suspect that it changed when he got to Athens. We read of his approach in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 20. I'll just flick that up for you. Where the Apostle Paul, it's recorded, tailored how he preached to the Corinthians... Unto the Jews, he said, I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as being without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I made all things unto all men that I might by all means save some. So the Apostle Paul was very versatile in his preaching and he adapted his message to best suit the audience. While it's clear from that little reference to the Corinthian Ecclesia that he maintained his integrity to God, as verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 9 makes clear. But coming back to Acts 17 verse 18, notice the core of his message was Jesus and the resurrection. Paul was not all things to all men in order to blend in. He was all things to all men in order to preach and to preach more effectively. It's clear from the reaction that Paul got from the Greeks here that he didn't camouflage either himself or the gospel when he preached. But sadly, that's not always us, is it? How was your weekend? Well, that's a question that gives us an immediate springboard to preach. Yet how often do we camouflage our weekend's activities so as to blend in rather than to stand out? We might at this point reflect on the life of Saul of Tarsus. What changed him from persecutor to preacher? How do you take a man like Saul and change him so comprehensively that he's now prepared to do almost anything to preach? There can only be one answer. His encounter with the risen Lord on that road to Damascus. And it was that that changed the Apostle Paul from persecutor to preacher. And it was that for all of the Apostles, the encounter with the risen Lord. And I submit to you that it has to be the same, effectively, for each one of us. A confidence that Jesus is risen and that he is the Lord. Well, let's hurriedly move on to consider the groups in verse 18, the Epicureans and the Stoics, in their context of Greek religious and philosophical thought. Before we look at the message of Paul, I'd just like to consider these uh, three groups. 
And you will notice there that uh, I've suggested the Epicureans have some um, philosophical similarity with the Sadducees. They were started by a chap called Epicuros, and it was their thought that the one and only source of truth came from your senses. And it was what we experienced that determined whether ideas were valid or not. And your interaction with them became the sole criterion of truth. They didn't reject the gods, but they just couldn't be bothered with them, really. They, they denied that gods were really of any importance at all. They did, however, reject immortality as a concept. This life is all we have, and if we're going to enjoy it, then we need to enjoy it with pleasure and prudence. So we'll, we'll live it up, but we'll be sensible about it. But life is there to be enjoyed, and this is all we've got. That was how the Epicureans thought. The Stoics, on the other hand, were founded by this chap called Zeno of Citium, and several centuries before Christ. So they've been around for a while now when Paul preached. They declared that the world around them demonstrated God. And that if you live in harmony with nature and live at peace with nature and demonstrate sort of natural virtues, then that's where your life should be directed. And in contrast to the Epicureans who are happy to indulge in any pleasure at all, if we do anything that might harm nature, then that's bad. And there are people like that today, aren't there? Um, and they embrace very similar ideas. Then there were the philosophers, starting with Socrates, who taught Plato, who taught Aristotle, are the three big names in Greek philosophy. And they sought to understand how life, the universe and everything worked through applying logic to various questions and, and discussing it with human wisdom as a, a major component. So these are the three groups of people essentially in the audience of the Apostle Paul. And in Greek society, these three branches of wisdom, the Epicureans, the Stoics, and the philosophers, coexisted together and they frequently debated things in the marketplace. One can only imagine that when Paul arrived teaching about Jesus and an Israeli God called Yahweh and a resurrection, that all of those concepts would have been quite foreign to them. The words in verse 19 are barely menacing in the AV, but the Greek word for took is the word seize. And they took him and brought him to Areopagus. That is, they arrested him and forcibly dragged him to Areopagus. And it suggests that the words in the King James, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is, are uh, not quite so polite a request as it reads in Scripture. It wasn't just an exercise in curiosity. This was a formal demand to Paul to be publicly examined for the preaching that he was making. So the preaching of Paul had stirred up such a commotion that the philosophers of the day arrested him and dragged him off to Mars Hill of which F.F. F. Bruce said, the council of the Areopagos was the most venerable Athenian court dating from legendary times. Its traditional power was curtailed as Athens became more democratic, but it retained jurisdiction over homicide and moral questions generally and commanded great respect because of its antiquity. So by the time Paul preached in Athens, Areopagus had lost some of its original authority, but it was where capital crimes were tried and where moral questions were heard. And it doesn't look all that much, but um, we'll see in a moment that this was 
the place with uh, an incredible backdrop. Um, and as Paul stood there, the sense of, of the occasion and the presence of the, the place would have been something quite remarkable. They stood Paul there and accused him of being a babbler. Doesn't mean he talked too much or that he talked drivel. The Greek word means a seed collector. I think, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, it, it came to mean one who hung around the markets picking up scraps. And metaphorically, it came to be used of someone who picked up scraps of information without having had any learning and didn't fully understand them and passed them off uh, as if they were their own, and repeated them. And used about Paul, it's an insult. It's an intentional insult to saying, this guy's got no idea, has he? he? He's not even learned. He's just picked up this stuff. He's got no idea what he's talking about. Unhappily, the Greeks picked precisely the wrong man to accuse for lack of learning. Paul had been educated first in Tarsus and then at the, at the feet of Gamaliel in Jerusalem. In his defence, Paul makes it clear that he had more than a respectable knowledge of Greek literature and thought. So they said, you're just a babbler, you're a seed collector, you just hang around picking out ideas. You've got no idea, really, have you? Well, he did. So let's hear what Paul had to say. Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. It literally means reverent of demons. I don't think Paul's using this in a bad sense, necessarily, but perhaps more to gain some common ground with them. He's basically saying, you guys are so respectful of your gods that you even have an altar dedicated to one you might inadvertently have omitted in ignorance. Well, you have actually omitted one god in ignorance, and I'm now going to tell you about him, said the apostle. It was actually quite a common Greek practice to erect an altar to the unknown god. An altar found on Palatine Hill in Rome, for example, in 1820 it was unearthed, states, whether to a god or a goddess. Now, we don't know if that's similar to the one Paul looked at. This one was in Rome. But it does illustrate the concept that the ancient civilization, in their superstition, did erect altars to gods they might accidentally have omitted. Of course, in true 19th century style, this one was pilfered by archaeologists and now sits in a museum. And if you look carefully, you can make out a light switch in the top right-hand corner of the photograph. So this is not in situ anymore. It's, it's in some museum somewhere. But just following the concept of the unknown god back a little further, we can trace it back to the life of the poet Epimenides, whom Paul's about to quote in a few verses' time. Epimenides lived in the 6th century BC, and at the time he lived, there was a plague which went throughout Greece, probably the Black Plague or something similar, which popped up with monotonous regularity every 100 years or so. The Greeks thought they must have offended some of the gods, so they began offering sacrifices on altars to various gods. Well, that didn't work. So they figured there must have been a god that they left out, a god that they didn't know, and a god that they needed to appease. So Epimenides came up with a plan. He released some hungry sheep into the countryside and instructed men to follow them. And he thought, well, sheep won't lie down unless they're contented, um, and if they're contented, uh, that must be the sign that there's a God that's blessing this spot and it's a sacred spot. So whenever the sheep stop and lie down, they built an altar and sacrificed the sheep. I'm not sure what the moral of that story is, 
whether it's you should keep eating and not lie down. But, um, the sheep found themselves on the altar whenever they stopped. And so wherever these sheep went and stopped, they erected altars to this unknown god. And eventually the plague subsided, but the Greeks believed that they must have hit on the remedy. And from this point on, worship of the unknown god was entrenched. Now Paul had researched his audience, and he knew that. It wasn't just a kind of passing shot. He presented his message in a way that was going to resonate with his audience and hopefully be likely to appeal. But we can learn much from his approach by tailoring our approach to suit the audience. How could Paul preach to them? They were in all probability ignorant of the scriptures, and even if they were, they probably wouldn't have accepted that they were an authority from God, nor have respected the God of the scriptures. And when you think about the bizarre stories that the Greeks came up with in their mythology to offer just incredible suggestions and explanations for the universe, it's no wonder that these three branches of philosophy arose because the alternatives were just weird. Almost anything makes better sense than Greek mythology. So Paul in his preaching here simply stated facts that made sense and appealed to their reason and logic and left it to their own minds to realise that it did make sense. And we might not appreciate the significance of the opening phrases for the Greeks standing on Mars Hill. That's the backdrop. Doesn't look like much now, but that's the Parthenon, the Acropolis. That's, that's the backdrop. All of those magnificent temples up there on the hill. In its heyday, which was when Paul was there, that must have been an utterly stunning backdrop. As Paul stood behind, you recognise the pine tree from the first photo. Paul's standing there and he's got all of that in the, the background. So the court of Areopagus was overshadowed significantly by the Acropolis and it was arranged that way during proceedings so that you were in awe of the just majestic deities of Greece. With that in mind, the phrase dwelleth not in temples made with hands must have been a bombshell not only so, but the verse that followed undid their entire system of worship. The unknown God that Paul was preaching was a very different God from anything that the Greeks had. Now, Paul's speech is perfectly in accord with the outline in Genesis. God made the world and all things therein. We notice the Greeks didn't complain at this. Indeed, their gods were credited with forming from chaos all of the things that they saw around them. So at this point, they're kind of indulgent, perhaps attentive. And Paul goes on. Everything we are and everything we have is from this God who is utterly self-sufficient. This is new, isn't it, for them? Contrasted with the Greek gods, Yahweh, that Paul was preaching, needs nothing from us. In point of fact, it's the other way around. It's us who need things from him. And they kind of absorb this novel thought and, and let Paul continue. To the Greeks, when we think of their divine order of things... Well, order's not quite the right word. There was chaos, confusion, adultery, betrayal and deceit as their gods quarrelled with each other, slept with each other, created a hodgepodge environment uh, and were generally just in complete disarray. Paul, on the other hand, is preaching one supreme God who created one man and from that one man 
all people who had ever lived. In the Greek version, everything is haphazard, but nothing is haphazard with the God of Paul's preaching. Verse 26 and 27 scream with purpose and intent. Just, just look at the, the phrases there. The will of God was seen that he created everything for men to dwell. He's determined the times. It's all done in ahead of schedule, says Paul. And the extent and all this that they should seek the Lord. So this is a God with, with purpose. This is a God with a plan. It's not haphazard like the Greeks at all. Consider the effort that God has gone to just to get us to respond and to seek him. It is, as it were, as if we were all blind men groping in the darkness towards God. And now the Apostle Paul quotes to the Greeks, two of their own philosophers, in order to point them to the true God. And the, the two people that Paul quotes from were Epimenides of the contented and sacrificed sheep story and Aratus. Epimenides wrote a work called Cretica and in it he had the following passage. They fashioned a tomb for thee, O holy and high one. The Cretans, always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. But thou art not dead, thou livest and abideth forever. For in thee we live and move and have our being. You might note in passing that Paul quotes the final line to the Greeks on Mars Hill, but the second line in his letter to Titus. And the other one Paul quotes from is Aratus in a work entitled Phenomena, where Aratus wrote, Let us begin with Zeus, whom we mortals never leave unspoken. For every street, every marketplace is filled with Zeus. Even the sea and the harbours are full of his deity. Everywhere, everyone is indebted to Zeus, for we are indeed his offspring. Now, it might come as a surprise to you, as it did to me, to learn that such magnificent sentiments as in him we live and move and have our being, and we are his offspring, are pagan poetry. But it's true. Paul quoted them and appropriated them for the preaching of God. There are some perhaps more stunning passages of Scripture that describe the relationship between God and man, but these didn't suit the purpose of the Apostle Paul. He wanted to find common ground with these people, to build a connection, to show them that he understood how they thought, how they reasoned. They imagined him to be a clever thought recycler. Notice that he doesn't even address that, but he's squashed it completely without even addressing it. See how difficult it is to gainsay your opponent when he uses your own expressions against you, which is precisely what Paul has done. It may not have seemed evident at the time, but Jesus knew full well what he was doing when he chose Saul of Tarsus and reasoned that he had exactly the right attributes to perform admirably. But also we need to remember the promise of Jesus in Luke 21. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. I think that promise of Christ clearly found a fulfilment in the mouth of Paul on Mars Hill. And if we preach as dedicatedly as Paul did, it will be no less real, that promise of Jesus for us. Are those philosophers that Paul was speaking to, whose very name means lovers of wisdom 
and reasoning found themselves academically in a tight spot. Paul, using their own logic, was making their own systems that they had built seem shaky. If the deities were the creators, why did they need stuff? If people are created by the gods, how come people create the gods? And all of the images of the gods using their own artist, artistic talents. And logically speaking, it doesn't make sense, does it? If we are the creature and the gods are the creator, then how can it be the other way around? The God Paul was preaching needed nothing and rejected objects of worship that were made by the work of man's hand. Paul became even bolder and he described the entire Greco-Roman system of worship as ignorance. Just leave your finger there and pop across to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul is admittedly in a letter to believers, but even bolder than that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and reading from verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So the Greeks sought after wisdom and they prided themselves in their learning. They were in fact ignorant and morally blind and Paul needed to show them a better way. And despite all was intending that Gentiles would be included in his purpose, God had for thousands of years been content to leave them to their own ignorant superstitions and work with the people of Abraham. The language of Paul is ironical. Gentiles in ignorance took no notice of God and therefore God took no notice of them. Until the preaching of the apostles, basically, only those Gentiles who embraced the hope of Israel came under the oversight of God. This, says Paul, was not to be the case any longer. God is now looking towards the Gentiles. The word commandeth that Paul uses in verse 30 in English doesn't give the entire sense of the Greek. The word in Greek is parangelo, which sounds similar to the Greek word angelo, which is angels. It sounds similar because it is similar. The word means to transmit a message, and that's what Paul was doing. Obviously, the message came from God, and he was the messenger. And the message was, repent. Now, Paul could not suggest to his Greek audience that they should repent because their lives were out of line with the biblical model. That would have been true, but it would have been meaningless for them. They neither knew the word of God nor respected it. He needed to appeal to their sense of reason. They cared enough for an unknown God to worship him but their worship in ignorance and debauchery was not acceptable unless they changed, and unless they changed, they would be judged, says Paul. So Paul's presented the matter to them in a way that these Greeks would understand. And we notice that there's still no outburst or rejection of Paul's message. To the Greek mind, it's all been plausible thus far, there could be a God that we don't know about who might be angry at us because we haven't worshipped him properly. 
uh, they'd gone down this path several times in the last few centuries, if you recall, with Epimenides and his sheep. Nor did the Greeks reject the idea of divine judgment. When they finally said, we've had enough of this, what they balked at was the resurrection. For the Apostle Paul, indeed for all believers, the resurrection is the guarantee that God can do miracles and will do so again. For Greeks, the idea of resurrection was just silly. The Epicureans, the Stoics and the philosophers would have all found something in Paul's speech up till now with which they could agree. But none of them had any place for a resurrection in any of their philosophies. The Epicureans and the Stoics both rejected an afterlife and the Platonists, the philosophers, held that the soul was immortal and the body at death was completely irrelevant and no longer a thing of consequence. So all of the groups at the mention of the resurrection had their attendance and their interest completely disintegrated. Those who didn't descend into mockery lost interest and politely excused themselves. The phrase, we'll hear the again of this matter, doesn't suggest that they wanted to hear him again, but it's more like the, oh, some other time perhaps. I've just remembered I've got to walk the goldfish. The chimney needs pruning or some other excuse and, and off they hurried. In any case, they didn't seem to have any agreement about what this new doctrine was and what they should do with Paul, and so he was allowed to leave. But the record doesn't end there. The word at the beginning of the last verse is, how be it. We don't use that word today. We would say, but. The preaching of Paul and the formal hearing on Mars Hill were not a waste of time. There were several who believed. Dionysius, who was a member of the Council of the Areopagites. His name means devoted to Bacchus, the Greek god of revelry. Revelry. Revelry and wine. Damaris's name comes from a Greek word which means to be tame. I'm not sure quite what the spirit intended recording those two names, but we seem to have two extremes presented here, the mild and the wild, and the gospel appealed to them both. We might have thought that a party animal entrenched in politics would never respond, and we'd have been wrong. Perhaps the message for us is not to make judgments based on prejudice, it's not only the mild, but sometimes also the wild who are attracted to God, as well as all of those in between. It's simply our task to sow the seed and water it so God can make it grow. Paul doesn't seem to have made much headway in Athens and was, it seems, disappointed with the response. And so he left Verse 1 of Acts chapter 18 records shortly after and went to Corinth. So we've all heard the message of Paul tonight. We've all heard that God wants us to repent, to acknowledge him, to feel after him and find him. What is it to be? Well, we can reject God entirely and laugh at the message and I sincerely hope and I doubt that any of us are about to do that. Or we might politely ignore it and continue on with our busy lives and leave God to some other time and some other place. But we oughtn't to do that either. Or we can join the messenger and embrace the message. And I fervently hope that we all do that. It's a sobering thought that the messenger was joined by those who accepted his message. The words in verse 34 say, clave unto him, 
This implies there was something about the life and the demeanour of Paul worth joining. We need to remember we preach as much with our life as we do with our mouth. Remember the motivation of Paul was by any means to save some. Let that, brothers and sisters, be our aim as we interact with those among whom we reside, that by our message, by our example, and by any means, we might save some. I thought I'd finish with some tough questions in the light of what we've considered tonight. Does it bother us that the world about us is ignorant? Do we camouflage the gospel? Do we prepare to preach? Do we tailor our preaching? Do we trust that God will help us? Do we really want to save anybody? And perhaps the hardest and most penetrating last, do we really, like Paul, have a risen faith? Thank you.